On August 20th, 2008, a Spanish passenger jet crashed just after takeoff from Madrid Barajas Airport, killing 154 passengers and crew. On first inspection, the cause of this crash was deceptively simple. However, once you dig deeper, what emerges is a story of tragic coincidences and ironies. The crash came so close to not happening at all. This is not a tale about a plane catching fire or a pilot flying into a mountain at night. This is a complex story about a crash that almost didn't happen. This is the story of Spanair Flight 5022. On the afternoon of August 20th, 2008, 166 passengers and 6 crew boarded Spanair Flight 5022 at Madrid Barajas Airport in Spain. Their destination was Gran Canaria Airport in the Canary Islands, a 3 hour journey. Most of the passengers were Spanish, but there were a small number of other nationalities on board, including some Germans, French, Turkish, Italians and others. The majority were holidaymakers, looking for a break from the stifling Madrid summer. The captain, 39-year-old Antonio Garcia Luna, was an experienced pilot, with over 8,000 flying hours. He had previously served in Spain's Air Force, where he had been a flight instructor and test captain. In 1999, he joined Spanair as a first officer, and became a captain on the MD-80 in 2006. The reports of his tests, simulator sessions, and line training indicate that he was an above-average pilot. However, notes during one training session were written about the need for him to improve his crew resource management skills, specifically demanding that he work on his coordination and rapport with the other pilot. Subsequent trainers noted an improvement in this area, however. Crew members who knew the captain described him as being disciplined, precise and meticulous in his job, and as somebody who adhered to procedures rigorously. The first officer on this flight was 31-year-old Francisco Javier Mulet. He had been hired by Spanair just the previous year, with only 220 total hours under his belt. At the time of the accident, he'd accumulated just over 1,200 flight hours, most of which were on the MD-80. Pilots who had flown with the first officer had described him as a serious and disciplined pilot, who was polite and made an effort to collaborate. They specifically noted how much he loved to fly and how happy he was to have the chance to do so. The aircraft being used for this flight was a 15-year-old McDonnell Douglas MD-82. While mostly retired now, the jet had been hugely popular with airlines in the US and Europe in the 1990s and early 2000s, and was one of the safest passenger planes in the sky. What is especially tragic about this accident is how close it came to not happening. At just before half past one in the afternoon, the pilots called the tower controller, reporting that they were ready for takeoff on runway 36 left. The controller cleared them for takeoff, and seconds later, the aircraft called back saying, Madrid, Spanner 5022, look, we've had a slight problem, we have to exit the runway again. The controller cleared them to leave the runway, and the pilots contacted the maintenance control centre in Palma. The problem they'd noticed was that the ram air temperature probe was showing an abnormally high reading. This probe measures the temperature of the air near the surface of the aircraft. Normally, as a plane or a car or anything moves through the air, it compresses the air in front of it, heating it up. This effect becomes particularly strong at the high speeds that jet aircraft travel at. At cruise speed, for example, this generally leads to a 30 degree centigrade increase in temperature. Planes need to measure this temperature for two main reasons. The first is so that pilots can decide whether to turn off the anti-icing heat in flight. The leading edges of the wings are naturally heated by all of the air compressing in front of them as they fly. For this reason, a fault in the ram air temperature sensor doesn't really matter if there's no icing expected. However, the second reason planes need to measure this temperature involves the autopilot, specifically the autothrottles. If the ram air temperature sensor senses a high temperature, this implies that the plane is moving fast, which implies that damage will be done to the inside of the engine unless the engine power is reduced. In other words, high ram air temperature means low engine throttle, which is not very helpful during takeoff, and autothrottles are generally used on takeoff in passenger jets. This means that takeoffs must be done in manual mode when the sensor is inoperative. It is likely that the Spanner pilots were unsure about whether it was safe to take off with this faulty sensor, given its role in something as vital as engine thrust. As such, they decided to return to the gate to have the system inspected. Ironically, the rat probe itself is fitted with a heating element, so it doesn't freeze over when trying to measure the temperature of the surrounding air. If this heating element is turned on while the plane is on the ground, the sensor naturally produces a falsely high temperature reading. While still taxiing, the captain used his mobile phone to call the maintenance control centre in Palma. Suspecting that the ram air temperature probe was receiving an unexpected electrical current, the maintenance control centre recommended that the crew reset the Z29 circuit breaker, which supplies electrical power to the rat heating element. The crew did this, but the temperature of the probe did not fall. The pilots taxied the aircraft back to the gate to have it inspected by maintenance engineers. The crew discussed a number of possibilities with the technicians which they hoped would reduce the temperature of the ram air temperature probe, even including using dry ice to cool the probe. The cockpit was a hive of activity at this time, with people entering and leaving, including the crew, maintenance technicians, the purser, and another Spanner captain who was travelling on the aircraft. The captain remarked on their significant delay and noted that they had to log everything that had occurred. 
pressure was building inside the cockpit to get the plane back to the runway as quickly as possible. On top of this, the temperature inside the aircraft was rising. It was 30 degrees centigrade outside, and the aircraft was not capable of cooling the cabin sufficiently. Passengers and crew alike began to get angsty and eager to go. The engineers spent over an hour trying to fix the faulty sensor, but ultimately they proposed that the crew simply pull the circuit breaker so as to disconnect the electrical supply to the ram air temperature probe heater. The captain agreed and the crew began to make preparations for departure. A spanner flight attendant was seated in the jump seat behind the pilots and was discussing the faulty sensor with the first officer. Meanwhile, the plane was starting to be refuelled. At just after 2pm, the captain exited the aircraft to personally oversee the refuelling operation to ensure that it was proceeding quickly. Because the plane had returned to the gate and shut off its engines, the pilots had to begin as if this were a new flight. This meant contacting air traffic control to request clearance to fly to Las Palmas. The first officer initially called the wrong controller by mistake, as he had left the last frequency set on the radio without preparing the cockpit for flight. This is indicative of the rushed atmosphere inside the cockpit at the time. It is exactly in abnormal situations like this when pilots need to adhere most rigorously to procedures. There is further evidence recorded in the cockpit voice recorder that the captain felt under time pressure when the pilots went through the before start checklists. As the first officer read out the items on this checklist, the captain anticipated the items ahead of time, saying his responses before the first officer got to the respective part of the checklist. Before taxiing, the captain also called air traffic control to determine whether there was any delay on air traffic control's part. It was the first officer's job to handle the radios, yet the captain was doing this for him. After starting the engines, the crew did the after start checklist. A total of eight items were read, but upon reaching the final item, flaps and slats, the captain interrupted the first officer before he could read it, to ask him to request taxi permission from air traffic control. The pilots never returned to complete the final item on the after start checklist. This was a mistake, but it was one of a number of opportunities the pilots would have to configure the flaps correctly between now and takeoff. As the pilots started taxiing towards the runway, they went through the taxi checklist. This included an item which involved the pilots checking the indicating light for the automatic reserve thrust system. This light should be on, indicating that additional automatic thrust is available if there is an engine failure on takeoff. If the slats are not configured for takeoff, however, this light does not illuminate. In this case, the light was off, but the pilots did not notice this. On this same checklist, there is yet another chance for the pilots to see that they have not set the flaps for takeoff. The last item is the so-called takeoff briefing, which has the pilots review the takeoff speeds, thrust, and flaps, among other things. The cockpit voice recorder revealed that this item had not been done. They continued making conversation with the flight attendant in the jump seat during their taxi to the runway, most of which was not pertinent to the flight itself. Lastly, and most confusingly for investigators, as the aircraft was lining up with the runway, the first officer made a final check, known as the takeoff imminent checklist. He could be heard reviewing the position of the center of gravity and the flap wheel position, as well as the flaps and slats indicator on the LCD screen. The cockpit voice recorder picked up the first officer saying, flaps 11, despite the fact that the flaps had not been set to 11, and that they would have read zero both on the LCD display and on the flap wheel itself. Investigators would later conclude that a phenomenon known as expectation bias was at work here. The first officer expected the flaps to be in the positions which he called out, and didn't truly look at his instruments to disconfirm this. There is a natural tendency in humans to look without seeing, leading us to see only what we expect to see. In addition to this, expectation bias is more common when psychological conditions are unfavourable, as was the case in this flight, with the time pressure and high workload that the pilots were operating under. The captain was supposed to be monitoring as the first officer carried out these tasks, but because he was lining up with the runway at the time, his attention would have been directed outside the plane. From this point on, there was really nothing to stop the crash, apart from a last line of defence known as the takeoff warning system, or TAUS. This system sounds an alarm when pilots apply takeoff thrust despite the aircraft not being configured for takeoff, say for example if the flaps haven't been set. For reasons we'll return to, this alarm never sounded. The takeoff run was normal, and when the aircraft reached 157 knots, the first officer brought the plane into the air. As soon as the aircraft became airborne, however, the stall warning and stick shaker activated. The aircraft banked 32 degrees to the right and continued pitching up, barely climbing to 40 feet above the runway. The first officer initially suspected that an engine had failed and reduced the engine thrust. However, immediately after this, he pushed the throttles to their full forward stop. This did no good, however, and the plane began to descend, impacting tail first and sliding along the ground. It continued across an embankment and ploughed into the opposite side, bursting into flames. All of this, from the time of liftoff to the explosion, happened in just over 10 seconds. Of the 172 passengers and crew on board, just 18 survived. It was Spain's worst air accident in 25 years. An investigation was launched immediately after the accident, headed by Spain's Civil Aviation Accident and Incident Investigation Commission, 
It goes without saying that the crew's failure to deploy the flaps was identified as the main cause of the crash. This, however, is like the tip of the proverbial iceberg when it comes to the causes of this crash. The deeper reasons for the crash, and the reason that the flaps were never deployed in the first place, go much deeper. If you think back to the start of this episode, you'll remember that the crew turned back from the runway just before their first attempt at takeoff. The irony here is that the aircraft at this point was perfectly flyable, flaps and all. In fact, the high temperature reading from the RAT sensor had been present on a number of this aircraft's previous flights, and each of them had taken off without issue. The crew's vigilance and safety-mindedness at this point of the flight became the thing that ultimately ended up killing them. They turned back to the gate out of an abundance of caution, and in doing so, imposed time pressure on themselves which they were unable to deal with. Their safety-minded attitude evaporated in the heat of the tarmac and under the pressure of their ever-lengthening delay. They began to rush through checklists, skipping key items, and skimming through visual checks. They began to look without seeing. The clearly delineated roles of Captain and First Officer began to meld together, and it stopped being clear who was responsible for what. Another irony in this accident is that the failure of the takeoff warning system, the last line of defence before takeoff, may have been related to the failure of the ram air temperature probe heating element, which is the reason the plane had to return to the gate after its first attempt at takeoff. These systems rely on the same electrical relay for their operation, and the investigation concluded that it was possible that this relay had failed. Other documentaries on this accident have mentioned this linkage between the takeoff warning system and the ram air temperature probe as a certain thing. But the truth is that after extensive inspection and testing of the relevant components, the investigation could find no reason that the takeoff warning system was inoperative on this flight. Interestingly, almost a year after the accident, another Spanair aircraft preparing to depart from Palma de Mallorca to Barcelona received a high ram air temperature indication while taxiing. The crew noticed that the temperature read 99 degrees, which was the most the two-digit instrument display could read. They remembered the Spanair crash the previous year and decided to test the takeoff warning system. They found that it did not work. The crew double-checked that their aircraft was properly configured for takeoff and decided to depart for Barcelona after logging the fault in the airplane's maintenance book. Boeing reported that it was aware of six cases that had been communicated by airlines from the year 2000 to 2008 in which there were combined high ram air temperatures and failed takeoff warning system tests, of which four were solved by replacing this electrical relay which both systems draw power from. It is thus possible, but not certain, that in the case of Spanair Flight 5022, the takeoff warning system failed for the same reason that the ram air temperature heating element malfunctioned. An exact mechanism for this failure has never been established, however. The final report into this accident included a number of recommendations so that crashes like this would not occur again. Among them, the report recommended that procedures for the MD-80 and similar aircraft are amended so that the takeoff warning system is tested by pilots before every flight. They also recommended that the European Aviation Safety Agency and the Federal Aviation Authority change the certification requirements of aircraft like the MD-80 such that the takeoff warning system cannot be disabled by a single fault, and that it provide crews with a clear warning when it fails. The report determined that had the first officer reacted to the stall after takeoff by keeping the nose below 13 degrees instead of pulling it up to 18 degrees, the flight may have safely climbed away from the runway. As such, the report recommended that takeoff stall recovery become a mandatory part of the initial and recurring training programs of airline pilots. Finally, a series of recommendations were made in relation to crew resource management, as this was a key contributor to the Spanair crash. Among them was the recommendation that EASA, the European Aviation Safety Agency, when evaluating airline training programs, ensure that the concept of a sterile cockpit is stressed, along with the consequences of even minor distractions, and also that examples of accidents are included in which the lack of a sterile cockpit was a relevant factor. If you found this video interesting, subscribe for more weekly air crash documentaries. Let me know in the comments if there are any accidents or incidents you'd like to see covered, and I'll do my best to feature them in future videos. Thanks again for watching.